will we receive the Spirit, His Word, His grace, His mercy? Will we open up our hearts? Will we listen? Thank you. Thank you. Um, say this after me, and this keeps coming up. I am a child of God.
relationship we have with God through Christ when we accept Christ as our Lord and Savior. Very simple, right? We all know that. Our relationship is based on a blood covenant that God and Christ have with each other. God as his own representative and Jesus as the representative of mankind. Anytime there's a covenant, you can study them. Uh, there was tons of them, especially in the Middle East and Africa. Uh, one tribe was cut in covenant with another, and, and the cut part literally back then was cut. Blood was, was uh, what do you want? Exchanged. Yeah, blood was exchanged. Blood was, there's a word there someplace. I can't remember what it is, but blood was, was cut. Um, the blood was exchanged, um, and it was a solemn occasion. Uh, the one who did the cutting from one tribe and the one who did the cutting from the other tribe were their covenant representatives. They represented the best, the most, the most powerful, the greatest of each tribe. And what they did was a representation of and applied to that particular tribe. Blood was spilled. Okay. God made a covenant with mankind through Jesus. God made it a blood covenant, the most solemn agreement two bodies could ever have. And as God was making the covenant with the man Abraham, he was also making the covenant with Jesus as the covenant representative of mankind. You can read all about it in Genesis 15 and 17. The covenant that God made with Jesus took the same form as the one God made with Abraham. God swore to Jesus as the representative of mankind, as well as to Abraham, that he would provide everything they needed for life. That was part of the covenant. Everything that I have is yours. Everything you have is mine, including my very life. Sound familiar? Jesus. God gave himself in the second form, in the form of the second person of the Trinity. Jesus gave himself as a representative of mankind. As I indicated um, in Easter, uh, the best way to picture that is a marriage. The covenant of marriage is a legal agreement, but it's also based in love, and that's the covenant that we have with God. We, we accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. We become part of the family of Christ, and because we're part of the family of Christ, we're part of the covenant of Christ. And it will never ever be broken because the covenant is between God and Jesus, not God and me, or God and you. If it was God and me, or God and you, it would have been broken a long time ago. I don't know about you, but with me it would have been broken a long time ago. It will never be broken because it's God and Jesus is the representative of mankind. Legal agreement based on love. So what does that have to do with what we're talking about? Hugely. Let's talk about being in Christ. The scripture discusses our being in Christ. Also it talks about being in Him. I would suggest that you go through the Word of God, especially the New Testament, and look at every scripture that talks about in Him, in Christ, in Jesus, because it applies to you. It's talking about the family. We have a legal right here. The scripture talks about being in Him. The first thing we need to know is that in order to walk where God wants us to walk, in order to win where God wants us to win, in order to live a life of victory the way God wants us to live, a life of victory, it's absolutely vital that we know who we are in Christ. And it's absolutely vital that we know what being in Christ means. We need to know what being in Christ is. And I personally don't believe too many people who invite Christ to know that. Know its implications, its benefits, its strengths, and its authorities, among other things. So let's start with the basics. What does it mean to be in Christ? First of all, let's take an example of a person in the army. Um, right there in front of us. Hey, stand up. in the army. 
he has certain rights because he is in the army. These are his legal rights. He has certain authorities because he is in the army. All of these rights and authorities are his. There's authorities to carry weapons. There's authorities to do this, to do that. There's authorities to order things. There's authorities and rights he has as a member of, as being in the army. When he retires from the army, he still is part of it because he has, he has rights, the GI Bill, et cetera, et cetera. He is in the army. He's part of the army family. He is a member of the group that formed the army. And when it comes to army things, they can't tell him, hey, you can't do this, or you don't have access to benefit to that. He says, yes, I do, because I'm in the army. <laughs> Sounds very simple. Because he's in the army, he has the right to do this or that. Because he's in the army, he has the right to have the authority to do what the army allows him to do. So let's take that example and apply it to the body of Christ. If you, if you have accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior, you are a Christian. Just like the analogy of the army, we as Christians are in Christ. We are part of the family of Christ. We are in the family of Christ. We are in Christ. If you wrap your brain around that tremendously, what it says is, because I am in Christ, I have the right and the authority of everything that the Word of God says. Yeah. And it's not because I'm cute. Because, well, no, it's not because I'm cute. It's not because I'm sweet. It's not because my name starts with an S. It's not because I'm um, this or that. I have these rights because I am in Christ. Now let's blow this out a little more. Now, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but Jesus being our covenant representative painted the picture of everything that's ours. Everything that belongs to us. Everything that we can have and everything that we can do. He painted the picture. He's the covenant representative. We are part of his team. And when Jesus said, you're going to do everything that I can do, even greater things because I go to the Father, he was saying it out of a covenant stance. You can do this because you're part of my family. And because you're part of, <coughs> because you're part of my family, you have the right to do it. You have the authority to do it. You have the power to do it. You can do it because you're in me, you're in Christ. Let that roll on a little bit. I have all the rights and authority that goes along with being a member of the body of Christ. I am in Christ, and I have that authority because I am in Christ. So let's go into a couple scriptures first. I want to look at some aspects of this today. At least the Holy Spirit does. Let's go to Colossians 2.15. You know, Rich, let's, uh, instead of 250, let's go to 213 and 14. No, skip that. Let's go to 211 and 15, sorry. I love this scripture. In him, you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting on the body of the sins of the flesh. By the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. <clears throat> and you, being dead in your trespasses and, and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made you alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting on the requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Having disarmed his bellies and powers made up respect of them, triumphing over them in it. Let's go ahead. I want to break that down just a little bit. I love how verse 11 starts out. It starts out in him. Obviously, the hymn is talking about is Christ. Let's go to verse 13 and 14, would you please? And you, being dead in your trespasses, 
trespasses and the uncircumcision of his flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having forgiven you all trespasses, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of the requirements that was against you, which is the law, which is contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. This is so significant. Because we're in Christ, what Jesus did, obviously, you know, is credited to us as well. Why? Because he's our covenant representative. It's legal. It's not that we're sweet, kind, and most of you are, you know, good looking, most of you are. Forgive me for those. Praise God. Sorry. It is credited to us, but it's legal. The sin we, as we know, the sin that we committed, God put on Christ. And then Jesus paid the penalty for all our sins on the cross and in hell. The word of God says that Jesus actually became sin for us. God took our sin, put it on Jesus, and God took Jesus' righteousness and put it on us. It's an exchange. Why? We're part of the family. We're, we're in him. That is legal. It's called the great exchange. And it could only take place because we are in Christ. We are part of the covenant of God through Christ. But let's look at it a little closer. Colossians 2.14 states that all our trespasses, all our sins, all our iniquities were nailed to the cross. Jesus took all of our sin upon himself, our unrighteousness. He took our penalty, our shame, our guilt. The entire curse of the law was placed on him on our behalf. And because he was nailed to the cross, everything he took on him that was ours was also nailed to the cross. And when he died, all those things that he took on himself just didn't stay on the cross. All the things he took upon himself went to hell when he went to hell. And when he was in hell, he had to pay the penalty for every sin that was on him. But when the total penalty was paid, he rose hell. Completely clean, completely righteous, completely in right standing with God. Think about it. Were all those things that, that were on him when he went to hell, on him when he was raised from hell? No. When he was raised from hell, the entire penalty of all the transgressions for all mankind had been paid for completely. He rose as a sinless, born again man. The Bible calls him the firstborn again of men. And I'm looking at a whole bunch of other born again people. And nothing that was on him when he went to hell was on him when he rose to hell. None of the sins that were on him when he went to hell were on him when he rose from hell. None of the guilt that was on him when he went to hell was rose with him when he rose from hell. None of the shame was on him when he went to hell, rose with him when he rose from hell. None of the curses of the law was on him when he went to hell. That was on him when he went to hell. Rose with him when he rose from hell. When he rose, he was clean. When he rose, he was righteous. So all the charges that were against him were left in hell. And you know what? If you are in Christ, the charges against you were taken care of with Christ on the cross and in hell. When you were born again, you were born again clean. Clean. No more penalty. No more guilt. The enemy tries to pick these up and throw them back on us over and over. But don't let him. Jesus took care of all those accusations in hell. Jesus took care of the charges against us in hell. And that's where they belong. And that's where they should stay in hell. Don't let the enemy get them up. And this is the first of four points that we're going to be talking about. First one is Jesus paid for them. And all that junk stayed there. Oh, what if I did this? Will I be forgiven? You know, Jesus, if Jesus didn't, Jesus took care of every sin that ever was or ever will be committed. And 
if he missed one, and I said this at Easter time, if he missed one, he didn't do his job. If he did his job, every sin we ever, ever, ever will be committed. Well, what about suicide? Every sin that we ever committed is taken care of. Well, what about every sin is taken care of? You're not an exception to the rule. If you're in Christ, you're free, you're clean, you're righteous. You don't have any more guilt. Don't let it come on you. You don't have any more condemnation. Don't let the enemy throw it on you. Don't feel like a second-class citizen. You're not. You're part of the body of Christ. Amen. Should have the big C. I'm part of the body of Christ. The enemy doesn't have any right rule or authority to put junk on you, to drag you down, to make you feel condemned, to make you feel like con stuff. You're part of the body of Christ, and you are in Christ. You are as clean as Jesus is. Because if he wasn't clean, he'd still be in hell. If he didn't take care of every step, he'd still be in hell. But we know that's not the case. He was born again. He went to hell as a representative of mankind. He went to hell as a man. He took care of every sin, although none of them were his or all ours. But he rose again. So point one, get rid of guilt and condemnation. Get rid of feeling like a second-class citizen. Get rid of allowing the enemy to make you feel like constant, to make you feel like you, you should belong in the bad. You don't. You're part of the body of Christ. You're clean. You're free. And all that junk is taken care of once for all and forever. 2 Corinthians 5.17. I love it. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away. Before all things have become new. So when I say, I'm in Christ, what I'm saying is, I'm clean, I'm free, I'm righteous. All my sins are taken care of. Psalm uh, uh, 1 John 1 9, I confess my sins, he's faithful and just to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. All unrighteousness. I am clean. I am in Christ. Clean. Point one. The point the Holy Spirit wants to drive home is our sins have been paid for completely. All of our sins, not just some, but all of our sins. Jesus paid for them, and all the charges against us are taken care of. Once and for all, on the cross and in hell. And that's where the accusation should stand in hell. God will never dredge them up against and accuse us. But there's someone who will try to do that. The devil who will try to take you off the field of play. He will try to take you off the field of battle. He will try to take you off the field of life. He will try to stop the word of God coming from your mouth. Why? Because they have such authority. It cuts them off right to the knees. It starts there and works their way up. He wants to stop us. And if he can stop us from saying, if he can stop us from believing what is ours, who we are, he's got us. Like Joyce Meyer says, it's between, it's this five inches or so between your ears, between my ears. The battle's in the mind a lot of times. The enemy will try to dredge up every sin you've ever had committed. He will bring in as much guilt and condemnation as possible. He will try to incapacitate you with guilt and condemnation. He will try to destroy you with guilt and condemnation. Don't let him do it. The family was paid on the cross in hell. They were nailed to the cross and left in hell forever. Don't let him take all that junk back. Let's go to Romans 8.33. Which says Romans 8 to 33 through 35, which says, <coughs> Ah, thank you. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? When it is God who justifies, that is, who puts us in right relation to Himself. Who shall come forward and accuse or impeach those whom God has chosen? By the way, we're the elect, we're the chosen. Mm -hmm. Well, God who acquits us, acquitting means not guilty. 
Who is there to condemn us? Well, Christ Jesus, the Messiah, who died and rather who was raised from the dead, who is at the right hand of God, actually pleading as he intercedes for us. Who shall ever separate us from the love of Christ, for Christ alone? Shall suffering or affliction or tribulation or calamity or distress or persecution or hunger or distress or persecution or peril for the sword? The answer is no. Who will bring any charge against God's plan? Is it, it is God who justifies us, declaring us blameless and putting us in right relationship with us. So what is that? What should that end up in then? Go to Romans 8, 1 through 3. I love this verse. Therefore, if you look at Romans, um, Paul spends a lot of time in chapter 7, basically saying he, he does everything, everything he does, he doesn't want to do. And what he wants to do, he doesn't do. So um, I'm not doing what I want to do. I'm really messing up. And I, I don't do what I want to do, what I should do. And he says, oh, how sad am I? And he, he, he actually, if you read into it, it's, it's the spirit man versus the flesh is what he's talking about. But it started, uh, and that, that, that whole thing, it goes right to 8, verses 1, chapter 8, verses 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation, no judge, and guilt of wrong for those who are in Christ Jesus, who live in love, not having the dictates of the flesh, but the dictates of the spirit. For the law of life, which is in Christ Jesus, the law of our new being, has freed me from the law of sin and death. And we're not going to talk about that today, but if you want to spend some time, dig into it and compare it. The law of sin and death versus the law of life that will open up horizons that you know that are amazing. Now, no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. Okay, the next thing I believe the Holy Spirit wants to talk about is this. Because sin was nailed to the cross, we're no longer in bondage to it. <clears throat> because we are in Christ, sin no longer has power over us. Jesus broke the power of sin over us. And when we joined the, the family of Christ, we left our former father, Satan. When our father was the devil, sin had control of our lives. Do you remember your easy days before Christ? Oh, come on. <laughs> come on. I don't know about you, but I was an evil. I really was. At, at, at times, think back, at times I do something, I go, man, I can't believe I even did that. The only reason I did that was my old man was, was a devil. My father was the devil. I was like him. I had his nature. Of course I was going to do stuff like that. But my spirit man went, man, I can't believe he was doing it. I can't believe he did that or I did that. But we switched fathers. When we were born again, we switched fathers. And that, that power of sin over us was broken. Are we going to sin? Yeah. Probably. Are we going to want to sin? No. We still have this zoop, 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 zoop all flesh that we have to deal with. And our flesh, wants, our flesh wants to go nuts. But we have control over it now. That authority over sin and the sin nature has been broken in Christ Jesus. And the more we mature in Christ, the more we have control over the sin nature of our bodies. In Christ has been broken. Munch on that. The next thing that the Holy Spirit wants to talk about is this. Because we are in Christ, we are no longer under the curse of the law. And the curse of the law is, I, I, I tell you, if you take it up, it's Deuteronomy 28, and it starts, I believe, someplace around verse 12, and goes to verse 64. And it says, all the curses, if you break a curse, if you break the law, here is everything is going to come on you. And it's like 50-some verses of just horrendous stuff. I mean, sickness, disease, poverty, uh, you name it. You read all of that, you go, oh my God. Those are the curses that the enemy tries to bring on us. But 
Galatians 3, 10 through 14. In the King James, this labeled as the law brings a curse. Verse 10. For as many of us are of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all of the things which are written in the book of the law. To do them. That's why people that think they can do it their way can't do it their way. There's no one that can live up to the law. God put the law forth not to show how you can make it your way. He put the law forth to show how impossible it was. And someone needed, that everyone needed a savior to go through it. But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident. For the just shall live by faith. Yet the law is not of faith, but the man who does them shall live by them. Christ has redeemed us, brought us back from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on the tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles through Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. And the Holy Spirit said, and you preach on this a number of times. The curse of the law is not ours. Anything that is in there, everything that is in there, is not ours. And everything that is in there, sickness, disease, poverty, is from the enemy. We've been redeemed, brought back from the curse of the Lord. Jesus took the curse once for all, forever. He took the curses. That's why you can say, by the stripes of Jesus, I am healed. I have the legal right to say it because I'm in Christ. He did it. It counts for me. End of story right there. And in Christ, he took it for me. But then he'll say, ah, oh, no, 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 you know what you did last week, you know, had nothing to do with it. My sin has nothing to do with Satan and the aspect of guilt and condemnation and accusations. David wrote in the Psalms, Lord God, I sin against you and me. Satan has nothing to say about it. He's not part of the equation. He doesn't have the right to be part of that equation. It's between me and God. But all of those curses, all that sickness, the enemy will try to con us into believing that we have to have it because we did this, or because we did that, or we did this, or we did that. And that's a lie. He doesn't have the right or the authority to put it on us. Is he going to try? Yeah, he's a lawless Entity, he will try his best to stick it to us. And we fight the good fight of faith. But when we say no, by the stripes of Jesus, I already have been healed. The reason I can say that I'm pointing to a friend right now who is winning the battle. Amen. Amen. The reason I can say that is because I am in. Christ. He took it. I don't have to. I won't. And I have a legal basis to stand there and say, go in the name of Jesus. Because I'm in Christ. So none of the curses apply to me. So any junk that's in Deuteronomy 28, the last part of it, all of it is curses. Anything that tries to come on me that from there, uh uh, that's not mine. That's the enemy's. I fight against it. I authority against it. I can get it out in Jesus' name. Christ has actually brought us, brought us back from Satan, so we're not under the law anymore. Instead of being under the law of the old covenant, we are in Christ and under the new covenant. We are under the covenant of God's grace. And I love Ephesians 2, 5 through 7. Even when we were dead, slain by our own shortcomings and trespasses, he made us alive together in fellowship and in union with Christ. He gave us the very life of Christ himself. The same new life with which he quickened him. For it is by grace and his favor and mercy which you did not deserve, that you were saved, delivered from judgment, and made partakers of Christ's salvation. Who says? And he raised us up together with him. And made 
did us sit down together, giving us joint seating with him in the heavenly sphere by virtue of our being in Christ Jesus, the Messiah, the anointed one. Uh, heavy duty to seven. He did this that he might clearly demonstrate to the ages to come the immeasurable, limitless, surpassing riches of his free grace in unmerited favor in his kindness and goodness of heart toward us in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Uh, because of that, Satan doesn't have only the right to inflict us with the curses that are under the old covenant. As I said, he will try, but if we give him as long as we don't allow him to do it, we have the legal right to come against him and stop him. But we could give, we can give him legal right. How do we do that? Through the words of our mouth. And I won't get into it today, but the power of the words of our mouth and heart are amazing. Why? Because we're in Christ Jesus. Jesus didn't say anything that didn't come to pass. We have that same authority. That's why uh, God said, Life and death are in the power of the tongue. And to paraphrase, if you say it, you're going to live it. Praise God, not everything we say comes to pass. Okay. And the last thing we're talking about, we'll talk about is this the authority we have because we are in Christ Jesus. Let's take the example of a policeman. I have a friend. He's part of the, the police force. He is a policeman in the West Seneca Police Department. And because he is in the police department, he has all the rights and authorities that go along with being a member of the police department. He has the authority to carry a gun, the authority to stop cars, the authority to arrest people. Because he's in the police department, he has the authority that comes with being in the police department. Take it over to the body of Christ. Because we are in Christ, we have the authority that God gave the man, Christ Jesus. And by the way, Christ is in his last name, as, as I'm sure we know. Christ uh, is a English rendition of the Greek uh, uh, version of Christos, and it basically means anointed one, and also refers to the anointing that he carries. So you, should, you could say Jesus, the anointed one, and his anointing, instead of Jesus Christ. Because we're in Christ, we have the authority that God gave the man Jesus Christ, and that is huge. And that's why, again, Jesus said, you can do everything that I do, and even more, because I go to the Father. Because when he went to the Father, the Holy Spirit came in here. And we were the first born again, the second born again people that had the Spirit of the living God in us. Jesus was the first, but no other person on the planet and the Holy Spirit in them. On them? Yes. In them? No. We got it in us. In them. We have the same authority that Jesus had when he was walking on the earth. That's why he said, speak to that mountain. Do it in faith and expect it to happen. And it will. We have the authority over principalities and powers. We have authority over sickness and disease. We have authority over the enemy. Jesus said, we even have authority over the elements. And I've talked to people who have diverted uh, tornadoes and thunderclouds around them by speaking the word of God. We have the same Holy Spirit in us that was in Jesus. We have the same promises for us that God gave Jesus through the covenant. Why? Because we're part of that covenant through Christ. And we're part of the covenant through Christ because we are in Christ. And because we're in the family of Christ, we get to share all the benefits of being in the family, of being in Christ. Let's go to Ephesians 1, 3, and we'll wrap up. Ephesians <coughs> 1, 3, may bless and praise for our nation and unity be through the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. Messiah, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual given by the Holy Spirit blessing in the heavenly 
realm. That's a mouthful, man. We have been given, <coughs> we've been given every spiritual blessing in the heavens. That's a lot of things. Realize what we have. And I love what Paul's prayer is, was or is for the church in Ephesians chapter 1. I'll finish up there. Ephesians 1, 19 through 21. <coughs> His prayer is for us that our eyes of our understanding be enlightened that we may know what is the hope of his, God's calling. What are, the rich, what are the riches of the glory of God's inheritance in the saints? And what is the exceeding greatness of God's power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power? That's Paul's prayer for the church. That we have a handle on power and authority that we have been given in Christ Jesus. So I encourage you, once you open this, start looking at scriptures in him, by him, through him, in Christ, by Christ, through Christ. Because God wants to do some mighty works, not only in this church, in this region, but across the United States. But he needs his army to be equipped. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm sure Dean would have a real problem with uh, the army sent him on the battlefield, gave him one bullet and uh, a slingshot or something. He said, go get a guy who can do it. Obviously, that would not be equipped. Equipping. We've been equipped fully and completely. We have all the weapons that we need to defeat the enemy, to live a life that God wants us to live, to prosper in every aspect of our lives, to put the enemy under our feet at every turn. We have that authority because we are in Christ. Amen. Father, I thank you for, you, uh, for the realm that you put us in, Lord. <coughs> I thank you, Lord, for everything that you've given us through the covenant. And I thank you, Lord, that we are blood covenant people in Christ, through Christ. And we do have all the authorities and we will operate in all of these.